Hello, my name is Christian Noss and I would like to present the talk Core Requirements and Approaches for Low-Cost Water Quality Monitoring Systems. This talk follows up to the last year's presentation Monitoring Water Quality through Low-Cost Tracking and Crowdsourcing. I will start with an example for a risk assessment on basis of a tracking observation and behavior analysis. And I will highlight mandatory parameters which represent the impact of hazardous substance. Closely related to the target parameter are the system requirements. A comparison of two different systems will show how such requirements are fulfilled and how these systems are limited regarding flexibility and applicability. At last, a low-cost approach with the aims of maximum flexibility and minimal complexity will be presented. Although it is unusual to start with results and end with the method, please note that this structure from bulk to detail is necessary to explain core requirements of a low-cost tracking approach. Let's start with an example where the impact of nanoparticles on a zooplankton behavior had been investigated. We use the model organism Daphnia magna because this zooplankton is widely applied in ecotoxicological studies. There are standardized husbandry conditions and a comprehensive knowledge about its behaviors. This enables one to easily compare the effects of the substances and to derive, for example, thresholds for the risk assessment. The substance we applied was nano-sized titanium dioxide. While titanium dioxide is used for all kinds of coloring white, irrespective if it is the, for the teeth or house walls, nano-sized titanium dioxide is mostly used in sun creams because of its capability to absorb UV light. However, actually there is a controversial scientific debate about the accumulation and the risk of nano-sized titanium dioxide for human health. And it was our aim to investigate the mechanical stress it causes to the zooplankton. Andre Dabruns already showed that the animals were coated by this material and their molting was inhibited. The impact, especially on the behavior, was still unknown. But also other with the behavior related properties were affected. For example, the growth rate. You can see here the body length plotted over the time of the experiment. The untreated animals had an almost linear increase in size with time. A similar growth was observed for a treatment containing 1 mg per liter of nano-sized titanium dioxide. But smaller size Daphnia were detected after 3 days of the experiment if the animals were exposed to 5 mg per liter. And the same for the exposure to 20 mg per liter. Please note and keep in mind that one has to precisely measure the body length at distinct times to estimate the growth rate. Immediately after application, we saw a very clear difference in the behavior. You can see here the pathways of 10 individuals in each treatment. The percentage at each subplot denote the residence and vicinity to the walls of the tank. Pathways and the percentage show that higher exposed animals swim more in the central region of the tank. For such an analysis, one needs the coordinates of all Daphnia positions at every time step. A third difference had been noticed in the swimming performance, that means the mean swimming velocity. Although one can directly see that treated animals were slower, one might criticize that this could be a pure size effect because treated Daphnia were smaller. However, velocities were significantly slower even in size corrected plots. This difference was obtained from the observation of the swimming velocity of individuals. As a brief summary for the exemplary investigation, we noticed that nano-sized titanium dioxide affects the Daphnia growth rate and behavior. Although a low concentration was not detectable by the growth rate, it was affecting the swimming behavior. 
In total, one can say that tracking was essential to investigate and to notice that titanium dioxide has an impact on the animals. Let me go more into detail of the mandatory parameters and start with a simple body length. I assume you agree that this fish is somehow big, but I also assume you agree that this perspective is much better for the determination of the body length. Also, the aspect ratio of Daphnia are much smaller in comparison to that of sharks. One will introduce big mistakes if one disregards the alignment of the organism during its size determination. Hence, it is strictly recommended to take the alignment into account, which requires at least two simultaneous observations from different perspectives, here denoted by the two blue arrows. The scaling must be taken into account too, because objects far away from the focal point are displayed much smaller on the image in comparison to the same object closer to the focal point. Here again, two different perspectives are necessary to estimate the true size, unless one uses telecentric lenses. Hence, to estimate the body length, but also for the coordinates of the positions, one needs a three-dimensional survey of the control volume. The last parameter, the swimming velocity, corresponds simply to the displacement of an individual covered in a unit of time. This time is usually given by the time between images. However, the time span must be very well known and should ideally be constant. The second task regarding the velocity determination from images is the question if it is sufficient to compute the velocity only two-dimensional or is it necessary to observe all three components of the position vectors. In our case of the freely swimming Daphnia, we noticed an isotropic horizontal swimming behavior. Hence, quasi three-dimensional velocities could have been computed only using two of the three components. But this might be different for other experiments or organisms. Nevertheless, the time between images as well as the image resolution must be selected in dependence of the animal swimming speed and accelerations. A comparison between a commercial and a self-developed system will show how these systems match the requirements for such analysis, but also the limitations regarding different applications. The commercial toxmeter on the left hand side allows for a very comfortable continuous flow through sampling. The sample preparation as well as everything related to the husbandry is integrated and automated by the device. It also allows for a really fast online determination, but these parameters are fixed. Furthermore, these devices are limited to a distinct number of only one organism species, which in case of Daphne Magna are observed by one camera that means only two-dimensional in a very thin chamber. The self-developed system so far was designed for static sampling and one has to manually control the environmental conditions. Parameters are estimated after acquisition, but one is not limited by a specific amount of default parameters. There is also a high flexibility due to the size of the test volume as well as regarding the camera setup. The transfer from an already existing system to a low-cost approach necessitates awareness about fundamental aims and requirements. At first, the system should enable one to detect harmful environmental conditions and changings, which requires a comprehensive background knowledge about the test organism. Second, it is desirable that the system covers a broad applicability regarding the test organism, which is related to a high flexibility and reproducibility. And a third requisite, especially for crowdsourcing, is that it becomes a widely used practice. Therefore, it must be a simple and low-cost setup. An example for a simple approach would be a setup using a smartphone with a camera, a mirror and a rectangular or cubic test vessel or control volume containing the test organism. Such a simple setup would already be sufficient to observe sizes and animal pathways three-dimensionally. The trick is only to subdivide the camera field of view into two perspectives, one showing the front view and the other showing the mirrored side view. This would also ease 
the simultaneous triggering of both image observations. The quality of some first images are fairly good. There is a high resolution and a large depth of focus, and the color image additionally enables one to detect individuals on basis of their RGB values. A minor problem in comparison to the usage of telecentric lenses exists due to the diverging lines of sight. However, with some additional computations, this is not a serious problem. Besides the hardware aspects, there are still some open tasks about the data handling. One possibility could be to capture only the raw video data and do the analysis at a global GIS server. The advantage would be a central homogeneous analysis, the direct application of the already existing tracking algorithm and the availability of many open source software packages as already listed, for example, in a Nature publication. A challenge, however, might be the data transfer and, which is also my own experience, a difficult analysis without knowledge about all details of the experimental conditions. Another possibility could be to decentral analyze the data on the smartphones and transfer only the results to the GIS server. This, however, necessitates app programming, where I'm not a specialist. Hence, some points of the crowdsourcing approach are still unclear and need further efforts. Finally, I would like to summarize that video tracking is a useful method to study organism behaviors and that such a behavior monitoring was successfully applied to investigate the impact of nano-sized titanium dioxide on Daphnia. However, there are many more studies using other animals and substances. I hope I could show that the aims and parameters one will or must analyze preset the system requirements. One of the most important requirement is definitely a comprehensive knowledge about the test organism one will use. On the hardware side, I've shown that there is a really simple and low-cost possibility which might be used for crowdsourcing, but further effort should be spent on the data handling. I hope you enjoyed and thank you for your attention.